Hello there. <clears throat> it is um, Sunday, March 21st, first day of spring. And we're back at the, welcome back to the Blue Hines Garage. Uh, so yesterday afternoon, I got this back up in the air and I removed the sending unit from the gas tank. I drained it. I have my little transfer pump and I drained it. I took five gallons of gas out of it, which about drained the tank. At least that's all it would suck out of there. I, I think the hose was at the bottom. I don't know. And uh, this is what I found when I took it apart. This is how this thing is built. You see there's this piece. This is like the bulkhead piece that goes on the outside of the tank. There's this little strap, this brass strap that goes from the terminal that you attach the wire that goes to the, the, the conductor that goes to the fuel gauge. You attach on the opposite side of this. See that, that stud sticking out there with the two nuts on it. Now it only came with one nut, first of all. I think that was an error too. And then there's this little brass strap that goes from that stud to the rheostat that changes resistant values, resistance values as the float goes up and down. You'll notice the inside of that stud where that strap fastens is made like a rivet. It's not attached with a nut or thread or it's like a rivet. And what I found was that the strap was loose on that rivet. It wasn't making a very good connection. And when you're only dealing with 12 volts, which is a rather low voltage, and you're only dealing with 30 ohms maximum, you need a pretty good connection. That wire is probably 20 feet long by the time it leaves the tank till it gets to the gauge. You got 12 volts pushing a signal and almost no connection. So with only 30 ohms to... Uh, to signal the gauge different levels from 0 to 30, uh, it's got to be a pretty good connection, and it wasn't. So you see there what looks like a rivet on that back side of that stud. The stud is sealed going through there, through that yellow nylon and whatever else they've done there. It doesn't leak. That, that part's fine. Uh, what I did was I put the nut on the stud on the opposite side of this metal piece so that it was flush. I stood it up on the anvil on the vise and I used a center punch first and lightly center punched that rivet piece and then used a drift uh, that was bigger than the little rivet area and peened it over a little more. So now it's nice and tight. You move, it, it, before the little stud where the wire attaches would rotate. You'd put a nut on it and you couldn't get it tight because the whole stud would turn. It's not doing that anymore. The stud is tight. If you move this strap now, if you try and rotate the strap, you rotate the whole piece. It, it's it's tight. It, now it's got a good connection. So I'm going to put it back in there and put some fuel back in it and see if the gauge responds. So wish me luck. Well now, after a fashion, this is what we ended up with. Can you see that? Uh, I put this in the tank. Um, put the terminal on it. Went to tighten the nut and the stud ended up in my hand. Here. The stud. Where is it? Came off. The little tiny uh, rivet type thing failed. There isn't enough material there evidently if you peen it over properly there's nothing left of the material so it comes loose. It came off. So what I did uh, I went to plan B took a 1032 screw I had to enlarge the hole a little bit in that strap, in that brass strap I didn't have a brass screw. I was looked for one and I couldn't find one. Enlarged the hole in the brass strap so the 1032 would go through it. Put a nut on it so I fastened the screw to the strap. 
went through my assortment of plumbing washers, you know, the faucet washers. You see these little flat ones here? Uh, I found a pair of those that were a little, t one size smaller than these, pretty small, probably quarter inch. Or, you know, I don't know, pretty small. You can see it. Where is it? You can see it wedged in there. So you see there's a washer, plumbing washer on that side. And there's a plumbing washer on that side. And they are bound in there by the two nuts. And then the terminal will go where the space is between the two nuts. You see where the lock washer is there? The terminal will go on the rest of the stud right there. So I, I have no more time today. I have to leave right now. You know, get ready to leave right now. But um, that's what we're going to try. And I'll let you know how it works. I did the, I put the ohmmeter on it. And the ohmmeter looks like it works fine. So, uh, so far so good. We got to, you know... Tomorrow we'll uh, finish putting it back in the tank again and put some fuel in the tank and try it out, see how it works. Anyway, bye. Okay, hi folks. Uh, welcome back to Blue Hines Garage. There it is again up in the air. And I know this is getting old. But uh, we're still playing with fuel sender issues. And I'll try and um, explain all of this to you. It's terribly lengthy. Uh, so you can see here, I have right now... Three fuel senders, all for the same application. 57 Chevrolet, all except station wagon. All right. Um, obviously, there's a similar unit to each of these w for a higher performance with a bigger fuel line. This is 5 sixteenths. They made one with 3 eighths for fuel injection and I think the dual four barrel. This is for all the rest, the V8s and the six cylinders. So it's 5 16th line. Again, all 457 Chevy. The one on the right has been put into the spare tank and the float is adjusted. The float arm is adjusted, not this one. That's the one that came with that tank. The one here closest to the camera. That one, the float has been adjusted so that it hits the bottom of the tank <clears throat> all the way down when it's at its lower limit. You see there's limits here on the rheostat. See the little tabs? Okay, so the float arm looks like this when you take it out of the box. It looks just like that when you take it out of the box. See the bend on the bottom? This one was in this tank. And it does not touch the bottom of the tank. The float does not touch the bottom of the tank. The rheostat works fairly well at the bottom. I think it's, you know, one ohm there, about seven tenths or whatever. This one here you can see on the ohmmeter right now is hooked up. The one that I have adjusted, it's half an ohm. That's real close to zero. The rheostat on these units goes zero to 30. Now, when I pick this up to the limit on the on the rheostat, it reads roughly 33 ohms. It'll bounce around there, I think, to 32, 9, 33. It's supposed to say 30 with a full tank, which is right there. You see, that isn't much lower. Again, this is adjusted in and out of this tank so that when the tank is the way it is now, that's the proper... Um, What's the word? When the tank sits in the car, it looks just like this. Uh, so I put it in there and I set the float so the float hits the bottom of the tank. It reads four tenths of an ohm on the rheostat. And then I turn it upside down and you can hear the float hitting the top of the tank. And uh, I'll put it in there and show you. 
Uh, but when it hits the top of the tank, it reads roughly 30 ohms. So that should read normal. Now, I've played with this unit that I have the ohmmeter connected to repeatedly because, first of all, the little stud that it came with broke off because it's essentially riveted on a little tiny brass rivet. It was loose to begin with when I tightened it. There wasn't enough material there and it came loose. You know, when I peened it over, it kind of made less material even. Put the one to put the terminal on it and, it and it came off. So I replaced that stud, that terminal stud, with a 1032 screw and a nut on the inside, a couple of plumbing washers, a nut on the outside, and then you, you know you bind the you bind the terminal between another nut on the outside. Okay, so that took care of that. Next thing I found was the float was leaking fluid. It had fluid in it. So I took it apart. I opened up the plug on the end of it, the soldered up plug on the end of it, drained the fluid, resoldered it. So at this point, I think it's holding fluid. I, I filled up the tank. I put 15 gallons of fuel in the tank with the meter connected to the rheostat and watch the meter climb. It's a 16, that's a 16 gallon tank. At least that's what the specs say. And I had 15 gallons in it and the rheostat was sending 21 ohms to the gate, 21 and a half ohms to the gauge. So it was reading like seven eighths full. It was reading really near full. And you know, obviously at the other end, it was empty. It was reading empty. So I was, um, satisfied with that. It wasn't perfect, but I was satisfied with that. Two days later, I got in the car to start it and move it, and the gauge wasn't working at all. I put the meter back on the sender, just like I have it now, and it was reading two ohms, I think. Two ohms or two tenths of it. Two ohms, I believe. And there's no reason, I mean, other than the float being full and had sunk, there was, I didn't see any reason for that. The rheostat I'm going to lift the float. See, I got the float up in the air. I'm holding it up. There's nothing I can do with the float to make that meter read 2 ohms. I'm jiggling the, the rheostat. I'm jiggling the thing. I mean, I'm moving it up and down a little too. That's why it's changing. But it isn't going down. It isn't going to 2, two ohms. When I put the gas in it, it was reading right here 21 and a half ohms so that's where the float was on top of the gas two days later i could not make it read more than two ohms and the gauge was empty now i currently have three units here these units are all listed for the same application do you see an issue here first of all i'll put this down at the bench Look at the three floats. Uh, are they all the same? Now, this center one, last night I was playing with it and I took that because it was sitting like this. You see, you put this in there and that float not anywhere near the bottom of the tank. When it's sitting, you notice how the angle of this, the angle, I'm holding the phone pretty level. So, the sender goes in there facing like a little downhill but you see it's it's nowhere near here I'll put it on top of the bench sorry there it faces a little downhill the floats nowhere near the bottom so you got to straighten that arm out the float arm out okay to make it to make the float go to the bottom of the tank obviously that's going to read empty and you're still going to have probably two gallons of fuel, three gallons of fuel in the tank. All right, so essentially this one on the end is set. So it reads almost zero when the float's touching the bottom of the tank. I think the rheostat goes to three-tenths of an ohm is where it's reading right now. So that second unit, this middle one here, I have that float arm straightened out so that floats going to be close to the bottom of it i haven't put that in this tank yet i just went and picked this tank up from where it's stored all the time again when you raise this float first one all the way to the top reads 32 like i said real close to 33 when you pick this one up i'll, I'll change the leads hang on 
what am I showing you? I'm leaning this against the tank. When I change the leads to the other unit, Okay, now it's reading the center unit. I don't know what you were looking at because I couldn't see the phone. So you see I have the leads now hooked up to the center unit. The center unit is at the bottom. It's reading half an ohm. Now I've got it raised up to its limit. It's reading 31.7. This one's actually a tiny bit more accurate than the other one because it's supposed to read 0 to 30. So this one's actually more accurate than that first one. But I have no idea. Now this, if you measure, if you measure this float when it's all the way up, I think it's uh, eight and a half inches. Hang on a minute. Let me do that. I'll come Where back. Was I? I was going to measure the float levels when they're in the up position. So this one from the bench to the center of the float is roughly eight and a half. This is the one that I have adjusted. I'm going to verify all of this, put it back in this tank when I finish telling you all of this put it back in this tank and verify that it hits the top and the bottom and it reads right uh eight and a half inches to the center of the float off the bench this one is seven and a half i believe to the center of the tank i mean the center of the float off the bench not not as far off as this one which is six and three quarters off the bench to the center of the float and this one has there's no way that I can make that taller while still having this hit the bottom of the tank because as soon as I make it taller over here I'm also making it taller over here okay uh, this other one I believe I can change this angle so that it still hits the bottom of the tank and I think it would be taller at the other end because I think there's a difference this one looks like it's pointing more angled instead of straight down than this one uh, these things are like I said they're delicate they're not right and it's not easy to figure out what's wrong I would like to I got a phone call while I was uh, before I came back to you with dimensions. Um, yeah, there's two things different here. You can see how much higher this one is off the bench, too, than this one. So maybe if this one was angled correctly, let's see here. Are the two... Yeah, you notice that one in the middle... This one, this, this tube is facing down. So that if this tube was the same level as this tube, and then you check the difference on the floats, I bet they would be the same. I have to measure the difference. In other words, what this measures right now to eight and a half inches, I'm going to guess that that's roughly two to eight and a half. That's probably six and a half inches of of course of of uh, change, and I bet this one's roughly also six and a half inches of change. I have to check that out. And what I'd also like to know is what made this unit, go, with 15 gallons of gas in the tank and the, and the float floating on top of that gasoline, what made the rheostat go from 21 and a half ohms down to 2 ohms? Because there's no way I can simulate that 2 ohms by playing with this arm. My son just had an idea. He said, tighten, put, the, put the, this unit in the tank, tighten it all up, put a, 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 a terminal on there, and see if tightening everything up changes the reading on the rheostat. I don't know why it would, because the rheostat's here, not here. So I don't know that it would, but I'm going to try that. Hang on.
Well, okay, today is April 3rd, the day after the last slow and boring video that I showed you. Okay, and I got the master uh, procrastinator Fabry Thinker here today, and we've been playing with this thing. We took it out because it did the same thing. I told you it did the same thing. I put it back in with an other float on it, and it did the same thing. It went to two tenths of an ohm, no matter that there was 15 gallons of gas in the tank. So we played with this for quite a while, and I think we figured it out. If you look, let's see if I can zoom this a little there if you look at that shaft where it goes into the rheostat you'll see it's got three little washers on it right there don't break it now sorry well i found these tiny little copper washers we split them and put because that shaft was it makes contact inside but it's just a friction kind of a contact there's no attachment to where it connects the rheostat to the housing it's just a friction kind of a thing. It's got this tiny little, like a ball pin, pen, ball point pen spring in there. And a little beast piece of brass hits the edge of the housing. And it, the shaft is sloppy. And some guy made this stud on here. Where's my hand? Some guy made this stud on here and didn't realize, electrician even, that where the stud was coming through the hole, it could touch. And exactly what it was doing, it was touching, but it was touching intermittently. Needed a plumber to think of that. Right, and the plumber says, you know, maybe it's touching, and no, it isn't, because it got the washers there. Yeah, but it was touching where it went through the hole. Uh, so, we, guess what we did? We put some shrink wrap on the stud, and put it back in there, and it's working. I think it's working correctly. So we're going to put it back in the tank, because as it turns out, the other one doesn't line up with the um, fuel line. The other new one for the same application doesn't line up with the fuel line. And I'm not even going to tell you that we shortened that, and that's why it doesn't line up. <laughs> but but uh, it, it sure looked, when I had it clamped on that iron, it sure looked like they were different. This I don't know. This Ooh, one's me. pretty nice, though, I will say. And it's the cheaper of the two. The, the, this one that we've been messing with is the $62 version, I believe. Uh, that you buy at Danchuk. This one? Uh, that one, I think, is the 62. And the other one that he said looks pretty good is the $42 version, yeah. the aftermarket that they say is not as good. It's much nicer. Not bad. The rheostat on that one is pretty pretty accurate, and I think the shaft is even less play in the shaft. Yeah, you can look at it and just see it's, it's nicely made. Yeah. So that's the one that Danchuk has a third party. They buy from a third party. This one here, Dan Chuck makes, I believe. At least that's what they tell you. All right, so anyway, we're going to put this in the tank and let you know how it works. All right? Uh, hello there. Okay, uh, welcome back to Blue Heinz Garage. Um, well, we've spent a little more time over the weekend. It's the 7th. Today is Wednesday, April 7th. Uh, we spent a little more time over the weekend playing with this fuel uh gauge sender whatever issue and uh you spent some more time with the sender and a couple of like i said i had three of them you'll see in that other video i had three of them out there the plastic one the one with the plastic float and all that stuff that uh, the float arm was nowhere near the, like the originals wasn't gonna i uh, disregarded that one that one Kate took that one completely out of the running uh, I'm playing with the other two, the one from Danchuk, the cheaper variety from Danchuk, and the one that I started with that had all the issues uh, up front that I had already dealt through two of the issues, the, the leaky float and the uh, uh, terminal that attached to the rheostat that came loose. Uh, we worked with that a bit more and corrected a couple more things. What I didn't realize... When I made the new terminal, the new stud for the electric terminal out of a 1032 screw, I put it through the housing and I put a plumbing washer on each side of it to seal it so it wouldn't leak. And what I didn't consider was that the screw, the screw needs to be insulated from the housing. 
It can't be touching the housing because the rheostat is creating a variable value uh, 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 for the electrical current to get to the housing. What I didn't realize was when I poked the screw through the hole in the housing is that the screw, if it wasn't exactly centered, could be touching on the edge of the hole through the housing, which it was intermittently doing somehow or other. If the housing, I guess, got twisted a little or, you know, whatever would make it, some, sometimes it would touch. Or maybe enough fuel was, some fuel might have been getting in there and making a, a conductor, creating a conductor. At any rate, we figured that out. We put some uh, shrink tube on the screw where it goes through the, where it goes through the housing and put it back together and we actually I, we noticed when we took the rheostat apart that there was quite a bit of slop in the shaft that, and, and that's how it makes contact it's got a little ballpoint kind of a spring uh, on this shaft that pushes it against the the contact on the inside of the cover and that's the only contact it makes it wasn't very secure and it wasn't a very good contact I don't think so like I said we put some we ended up taking some tiny little copper washers that I had and split them put them on the outside of the of the shaft to take up the slop where it makes a 90 degree bend and we soldered they were copper and we soldered them to the shaft and took all the slop out and so now I think we got a sending unit that works it does what it's supposed to it's got the right value when it's on empty and a very close value when it's on full we put it in the tank and wasn't happy with the reading we were getting. It's reading. It's not going to empty immediately like it was. But we're not getting what I thought was an accurate reading on the gauge. So what I did is I used this spare one that I have here that also has makes good values. The rheostat goes from like half an ohm to 31, I forget, 31 ohms roughly. Uh, and it's supposed to be 0 to 30, so that's very close. What I did here is I took some jumpers, a couple of jumpers. You see all the wires here on the floor. I took some jumpers, and I set the meter up here. I set the, the sender up there, and I wired it to the wires in the car, to the ground on the car, and the wire going to the gauge in the car. And when the sender is at where it would be reading full, where it should be sending 30 ohms to the tank. And like I said, this one sends 31 ohms, so it's really close. The gauge only goes to 7 eighths, where it should say full by all, you know, by all means, it should say full, it's only saying 7 eighths. End of the long story is I contacted Classic Instruments, that's whose gauges these are. And I gave the guy all this information and I was waiting for him to say, well, check your grounds. Your grounds probably aren't good. And, he, and when I mentioned that to him, he goes, no, uh, I wasn't going to say that because if the grounds are no good, then you get a full reading, not an empty read, not a uh, empty reading. So um, he said, sounds like there's something wrong with the gauge. Just take the gauge out, send it back to me. We'll make it right and and return it to you so that's where we're at right now so that, that means i got to remove the cluster which i'm not looking forward to uh, i got to protect the steering column protect the cluster all that other good everything's finished uh so anyway i got to remove the cluster take that gauge out package it up send it back to michigan where they're at uh, i guess they'll either fix it by putting new coils inside of it or something or replace it seems to me like the practical cheapest way for them to treat it would just be to send me a new one but that's not what he said anyway i'm getting ready to do that uh, that's it for now that's the latest uh, at least we're making some progress we know it's not the sender and we've improved the sender actually so anyway talk to you later thanks for watching bye well this is encouraging um took the sender out one last time and uh, <clears throat> made sure that the arm was swinging, the float arm was swinging freely with the little washer soldered, soldered taking up the slack. And it was kind of sticky at both ends.
So I melted the solder and worked the lever, the arm to both in both directions until I got it to where when the solder was cold, uh, it was free at both ends. Cause what it was doing was kind of sticking at one end or the other end. And right now it's, it, it is, I got it to where it was nice and free. Put it in the tank and it was reading uh, with the gas that was in the tank was a tiny bit over five gallons. It was reading 11.2, I think the reading was. I know it was 11, 11.2, I think. And right now I'm, I'm siphoning this five gallon can in there. Uh, it was up right below where the little light is sitting. You can see the fuel level, see the dark area right below where it says gasoline. Uh, so maybe I've siphoned two gallons in there right now. And it went from 11 to 15.2, which is about right. Uh, theoretically with, uh, this is a 16 gallon tank. So theoretically with a little bit over 10 gallons in it, it should be reading a bit over 20. So we're heading in that direction. If it goes two ohms per gallon, we're going to hit 20. I don't know if it's going to do that, but because the rheostats aren't terribly accurate. They're pretty primitive. But it is going up and it's going up nice and evenly. Right now it's going up two ohms per gallon. So if it continues doing that, it should be reading right where it, it's supposed to. Anyway, we'll, uh, I'll show you more later. Wow. I mean, I'm actually excited of all things with uh, an ohmmeter. That's with another five gallons. Um, it read, what did I tell you, 11.2. When I put the sending unit in the tank and I know it had five plus gallons, maybe six. I kind of, I don't think there was there six, but it, you know, a little over five gallons. I added five gallons uh, and it went to 22, 22, 22.1, which, you know, he's perfect. You're thinking that it's a 16 gallon tank that's got 10, 11 gallons in it now, let's say. Uh, it should be a bit over 20, 21, 22 is, looks pretty close. I'm tempted to put the, I got another five gallon can here. I'm tempted to put that in there and see where it goes. Uh, anyway, I'm really excited at this point. We finally got that freaking sender to work like it's supposed to. It's never done this before. The most it's ever done with 10 gallons or 11 gallons of fuel in it was 17 ohms. And it did this perfect. It, it was one sticky spot it looked like at 16 ohms. It kind of hung there, 15, 9, 50, it stayed there. Shook the car a tiny bit and it went to 16.6. So there's one sticky little spot right at around 16 ohms. Otherwise, this is perfect. See ya.